Welcome to Business Impacts of Clinician Burnout, brought to you by Constellation and its growing portfolio of MPL insurance companies, including MMIC, UNIA, and Arkansas Mutual. If you're having difficulty hearing this webinar through your computer, you can hear the webinar audio through your telephone. So just call 866-927-1519 and enter the PIN you used to log on to the website. Handouts for today's presentation are available in the Handouts tab, which is found on the left side of your screen. Our speakers will address questions after today's presentation as time allows. However, you may submit your questions at any time throughout the program using the chat feature, which is located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Just type your question in the available box and press the blue Send Submit button. The objectives for today's webinar are, one, to discuss the Medical Professional Liability Insurance, MPLI, perspective on clinician burnout, and why caring for healers matters. Two, to understand the organizational costs of burnout and the ROI of well-being initiatives. I would like now to introduce today's speakers, Laurie Drill-Mellum, MD, MPH, and Liz Farron, MSW, LICSW. Lori Drill-Mellum, MD, P MPH, is Chief Medical Officer at Constellation. She is a board-certified emergency med medicine physician and practiced emergency medicine full-time at Ridgeview Medical Center in Waconia, Minnesota from 1991 to 2012. She is a graduate of the Emergency Medicine Residency Program at HCMC and completed a Bush Medical Fellowship in Integrative Medicine at the University of Arizona. Liz Farron, MSW, LICSW, is a senior consultant and healthcare practice lead with Vital Work Life. Liz is a licensed independent clinical social worker and received her MSW degree in clinical social work from the University of Minnesota. She is an experienced trainer and educator in the areas of change management, stress management, and conflict resolution, focusing on the healthcare sector to support physicians, advanced practitioners, and nurses. Welcome to the, pro to the program, Dr. Drill Mellum and Ms. Farron. We're now ready to begin. Go right ahead. Good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. This is Dr. Laurie Dromelm, and I want to really thank you so much for taking the time to participate in this webinar with me and Liz. Uh, we are quite passionate about this topic around the business impacts of clinician burnout. Um, as all of you know, uh, physicians and other healthcare professionals are a precious resource, and they're suffering. And to make matters worse, when physicians suffer the downstream effects on patient safety and satisfaction, risk management, staff retention, and recruiting are immense, especially in light of impending labor shortages in healthcare. Constellation and Vital Work Life, we teamed up to present this webinar, the first of a two-part series on the business impacts of clinician burnout and the ROI of well-being initiatives. So why is it that Constellation and Vital Work Life have teamed together in this effort. Next slide. Oh, I'm going to just work on my control thing here. Sorry. We've already reviewed the learning objectives. And what we'd like to say is that both Constellation and Vital Work Life have a shared purpose where physicians and other clinicians are healthy, productive, and valued members of their healthcare communities. And this uh, webinar and both of us, this promotes our purpose jointly and individually to encourage proactive and preventative support programs for physicians and all those who devote their lives to healthcare. And we recognize the need for a holistic approach to address and maintain healthy spiritual and emotional balances in our physician population. So a little bit about myself. How is it that I ended up um, really being passionate about this topic? I've been steeped in medicine my whole life. I grew up in a medical family and practiced emergency medicine for over 25 years. 
Um, I'm very interested in culture and majored in anthropology. I've studied psychology for years. And most recently, I, com I completed a fellowship in integrative medicine, which looks at other ways to help people manage stress and promote well-being in their lives. I worked as a chief medical officer here at Constellation since 2012 and continue to have a clinical pra practice now in hospice. My favorite stress reduction technique or well-being promotion technique is a 478 breathing uh, technique, which is easily Googled on YouTube, and you can learn how to do it if you're interested in finding out how to do that. Liz, would you like to share a little bit about yourself? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so I'm Liz Barron, and I am the healthcare practice lead with Vital Work Life, which is a national behavioral health consulting firm. Uh, I've been providing coaching and counseling to physicians and leaders in, in healthcare for about 10 years. But even before that, uh, the challenges of healthcare were pretty familiar to me. I have a couple of siblings that are physicians, and uh, one of them is married to a physician, and the other is married to a nurse. So you can imagine what uh, conversations are like over the dining room table, and I, I feel like I learned a lot from them. Uh, I do belong to the Coalition for Physician Wellbeing, and actually just got back from their national conference in San Antonio. I'll kind of fired up now about this particular topic. And lastly, I guess what I would say for, for I do a, a lot to take care of myself, but one thing that's very important is a gratitude practice. And every morning I identify five things that I'm grateful for, and that seems to help a lot. Thank you. So one might wonder what is a collection of medical professional liability companies, which is what Constellation is, um, what's our interest in this topic of physician well-being? And I like to think of this uh, story that's often used in uh, Indian culture that talks about in an elephant, if you have five blind people um, feeling one part of an elephant, they're going to describe what an elephant uh, is to them or feels like from different perspectives. If you're looking at the trunk or the ear or the toes um, or the tail, it all looks and feels different. And from the constellation perspective, uh, we're a company, we're a collection of companies that were formed by and for physicians. And we see uh, the perspective of clinicians who are involved in patient harm events, unanticipated events, some of which end up in a claim or lawsuit and we see the aftermath of this, um, situations where no one really ever wins. Uh, we also believe that by taking care of members of the care team that we're ultimately um, improving business outcomes. And obviously as healthcare businesses, we know that adverse events, patient harm events, and how well our clinicians are doing impacts uh, brand, hiring, retention, engagement, safety, risk, and the liability of seeking uh, legal remedies when things go wrong. So that's kind of our perspective that we bring to this story. So we want to do a little level setting so that people understand some of the data around this topic. Uh, and it starts with this fact that physician burnout climbed 10% between 2011 and 2014. This was uh, published in Mayo Clinic proceedings in 2015, and it went from 45% uh, to 55% on average for across all specialties. So why now? Um, this problem is growing, and we are big believers in that this is a problem without directed focus and attention to uh, there will not be improvement. Um, I don't think you can pick up a general medical magazine or um, many uh, mainstream publications such as the New York Times, Time, um, NPR, Healthcare Finance, and not read about what's happening around uh, clinician stress and burnout. And so just to level set also, when uh, you look at the data on this, these are the three components uh, that are measured by probably the gold standard for, for burnout, which is the Maslach Burnout Inventory. And it consists of three components, depersonalization, 
a low sense of personal accomplishment, and emotional exhaustion, all of which combine to lead to decreased effectiveness at work. And I would say for physicians, um, emotional exhaustion and depersonalization, which means uh, thinking of people who seek our care as either disease entities or body parts um, would define what depersonalization actually looks like in a patient encounter. So just to reiterate, burnout levels have gone up to 55%. Um, through trending analysis uh, done out of the Mayo Clinic. This is a quote from a, a physician here at HCMC in Minneapolis. Burnout makes it nearly impossible for in individuals to provide compassionate care for their patients. So why does it matter? Why does really uh, recognizing the incidence of burnout and why does promoting resiliency in healthcare matter? Well, we know through multiple publications and research that burnout and emotional exhaustion result in reduced capacity for empathy, and this all leads to decreased patient satisfaction, increased medical errors, increased risk for malpractice, and increased mortality rates. We know that physicians who are happier in their careers are more effective in working with patients on behaviors that improve health, which has the potential to lower the overall cost of care. We also know that when things go wrong, when there's an error or a harm event, that this results in feelings of guilt and frustration. And we know that there's a cyclic pattern to being involved in adverse events or harm events that lead to increased errors and uh, decreased quality of care and patient safety. And without attending to this, um, things just get worse. We believe here at Constellation that what's good for care teams is good for business. Here are some facts that 80% of physician burnout is really due to workflow issues. Fact, 21% of a physician's time is spent on non-clinical paperwork. In fact, in observational studies published by Dr. Sinsky uh, in 2016 in the Annals of Internal Medicine, clinicians spent an average of 5.9 hours of an 11.4 hour day on the EHR. Um, most of this is done during clinic hours, 4.5 hours, but an additional 1.4 hours are done after clinic hours or during what Dr. Sinsky calls pajama time in the evenings or on the weekends. This is a problem that's not sustainable. In 2016, the top CEOs from many of the healthcare systems, including the CEO of Cleveland Clinic and the Mayo Clinic, gathered to talk about this issue. They see the cost of physician burnout in that it results in productivity loss, recruitment costs, impact on other providers who are left behind or working with burned out um, clinicians, it impacts quality of care, and ultimately the sustainability of an organization. The estimated cost to replace a single physician, which is certainly influenced by geography as well as specialty, runs between $500,000 and $1.3 million per physician who leaves due to burnout. This is an interesting publication of what happened at Stanford Medical Center. They did a survey of physicians in 2013. 10% of, of the 10% that weren't burned out in 2013 compared to ones that were, um, an additional 11% left by 2015 that was attributed to burnout. Now that's a large academic medical center with 2,023 physicians at the time of this study. That 11% that left because of uh, what, what was attributed to burnout cost that organization approximately somewhere between 15 and $55 million. So this starts getting into the real cost of not attending to this issue. I'm going to hand it over to Liz Farron now, who's going to talk about uh, some of her uh, perspectives and research from Vital Work Life as it relates to this topic. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Drummond. Uh Just to summarize then, obviously, uh, the 
a burnout has a significant impact on patient care and safety, care teams, and the effectiveness of the whole organization. I want to talk a little bit more about the impact on the physician, the impact on individual physicians and other practitioners. So if you look on the left side of this diagram, you'll see that burnout's been linked to relationship difficulties, both at work and outside of work, substance abuse, depression, and perhaps most concerning and even startling is the increased risk of suicide for, for physicians. In fact, physicians have the highest suicide rate of any profession, twice that of the general population. So how else are they different than the general population? Uh, burnout rates for physicians are higher than those of others, higher than those of others in, in other kinds of work, and satisfaction with work-life balance for physicians is lower. The graph on your left shows burnout rates between 2011 and 2014 staying pretty flat for the general population, but you can see it's trending upwards for physicians. And then the graph on the right, you see that during that same time frame, satisfaction with work-life balance improved for the general population while declining for physicians with an ever-increasing gap between the two. So why physicians? I think that um, Dr. Dromalm has already uh, spent some time talking about the various kinds of practice challenges that can contribute to burnout. And again, right now, um, the statistics and research is telling us that 80% of burnout is due to business processes and systems and workflows within organizations. Uh, so we understand that, but there's a little more to it than that. Um, because there are personal and professional characteristics that make physicians almost hardwired to burn out when faced with increasing demands on their time and energy. And I want to talk a little bit about this, and it's not at all to blame the victim, quite the contrary. First, for the most part, they're driven, high-performing, high achievers who are going to continue to put out more effort the more you ask of them or the higher you raise the bar. So they're vulnerable to burning themselves out um, before it comes to a point where, where uh, the patient is being impacted or the healthcare or, or, them, or, or notably or, or visibly themselves. Second, the commitment to patient health and doing no harm leads to a well-worn path of sacrificing time and energy to take care of patients. A common example that I think of with that is squeezing another patient in to an already full schedule. You know, I think that most physicians will tell you of um, examples where they've done that. Others will say that this is happening on a, on a daily basis to them. They also um, can fall prey to the as soon as trap. Have you ever heard of the psychology of postponement? Uh, many physicians experience this, um, and, and it, it, comes, it starts out at the beginning of their practice but when they start to think, well, after medical school, that's when I'm going to find time for myself. That's when I'm going to be able to focus on my relationships and my personal life. Then it's after my residency. Then it's after my fellowship, so, so on and so forth. And I know that Dr. Drill Mom was saying to me that she read a, st a study where uh, a number of the responders were saying that they were going to wait until they retired to be able to find time to take care of themselves or devote to their families. So, um, so that's a, a, a well-worn path, I'd say. Anything I should know here? Um, well, one thing, we just got a, a comment uh, that burnout um, and address is really an effect of systems issues and that it's sort of that's the result of systems issues. And um, I absolutely believe that. I absolutely believe that. And 
There's actually uh, something that the, the Wellness Center at Stanford is promoting, and this is being promoted on the Steps Forward website of, that the AMA has, and which we reference at the end of this uh, presentation, is that there really has to be a three-pronged approach to addressing wellness, and one of those three things is culture, okay? So if your leadership and culture doesn't support addressing these issues, you're not going to get very far. And so that's part of a systems uh, mindful approach to this. Two is uh, efficiency. So physicians and other healthcare clinicians went into this profession to help and to serve patients who seek their care. And uh, these workflow issues where they're spending lots of time on EHRs and not on taking care of people uh, is not a good use of their time and they're not working up to their uh, level of training. So uh, workload efficiency as well as workload um, is part of it. Um, and then is there support and recognition that individuals have uh, needs and need to be supported uh, in their attempts to have some sort of uh, well-being in their lives. And there are uh, lots of studies to suggest that how an institution and their culture and leadership uh, supports uh, physicians on the front line of care and other health care providers is, is very important. So. Uh, this is not a simple problem, um, and it involves addressing this issue on multiple levels. So absolutely, I, I often speak to physicians uh, about this issue. We're a very resilient group of people. We work very hard. Um, we carry a lot on our shoulders. Um, and until and unless we address some of the other things that are driving this problem, some of many of which we will address in the second part of our webinar, which is going to be on September 5th, where we, where Vital Work Life has gone to the front line of care and surveyed physicians and advanced practice uh, providers about what they need and what they want and what's important to them as we look at solutions. Until we do that, we won't get very far. So I thank you for that, that point. So we'll go on from here. Thank Thanks. You. Thanks. At Vital Work Life, we've conducted several uh, surveys on stress and burnout, all with our partner, Check a Search. And uh, in most cases, we've had over 2,000 respondents across the country, across specialty groups, across practice settings. And we usually offer a few open-ended questions at the end where people have an opportunity to offer more comments about the experiences they're having. Uh, either personally or, or what they're observing or what they're experiencing in their organization. And these quotes come from our 2015 survey on stress and burnout. And I want to tell you that we had 17 pages, single-spaced, of these kinds of quotes from physicians. And, and I bring this to you just to, I guess, bring the human side forward. Uh, I'm not going to read these to you. You can read them yourself, but um, generally speaking, they're talking about the pain and the loss of joy and um, how that impacts them personally and, of course, how that's going to impact them in the workplace and with patients as well. I think we understand that. So this slide, because we've talked about it, but I'm going to tell you why I've got it up here right now, and that is because... With a looming physician shortage, most healthcare organizations are concerned about retention and they're concerned about um, reducing turnover when it, at all possible. And the reduction of turnover is one of the ways that ROI is calculated for well being initiatives. That's one of the areas that we look at in terms of seeing what the impact is on the organization if they initiate uh, a well-being initiative. This 
calculator was developed by Christine Sinsky of the AMA and Tate Shanafelt, who uh, many of you know was formerly with Mayo Clinic, now is at Stanford. Um, you can actually find this calculator and use it yourself by going out to AMA's Steps Forward website. Um, it's based on the research suggesting that physicians with burnout are twice as likely to leave their jobs as their counterparts. So even with just knowing that, you can imagine the reduction to turnover if you're able to reduce burnout. You can plug in your own numbers. This is just a screenshot of the calculator. In this case, the population of clinicians is 1,000. They've used a 50% burnout rate, and I think um, the research would suggest it's anywhere between 46 and 54%, so they've used kind of a high burnout rate. They use a 7% turnover rate, which happens to be the average in healthcare systems across the country. And, you know, you're going to have some turnover regardless, right? What we're interested in is um, how many people are leaving because of burnout. They've gone with a conservative rate to replace a physician of 500,000. Uh, sometimes you will hear that quoted as a million and even a million five. So they're using a pretty conservative rate right here. And looking at uh, this calculator will show how many people will leave the organization strictly due to burnout. Um, and then when you consider the cost, of replacing a physician. You can see what the cost of those burned out physicians is to the organization and, and, and how it would be reduced, again, if you were able to reduce burnout. So ROI efforts to reduce burnout, uh, successful interventions to reduce burnout can save millions just in terms of turnover. That's not even taking into account productivity, patient satisfaction, quality, and safety, potential reduction to litigation risk, all the various human factors that I've been talking about. Um, just looking at uh, the savings in turnover and retention uh, is a tremendous savings to the organization. So now I want to tell you a little bit about this slide. And um, what it is, is a slide that um, it demonstrates the kinds of offerings we have within Vital Work Life. We offer comprehensive programs to support individual physicians and also organizations um, to reduce burnout, to uh, set the conditions for physicians to thrive, to build culture at work, a variety of different offerings to do that. And we are a contracted service, so um, in order to work with healthcare organizations, we essentially need to sell our services. So you can imagine that looking at this ROI of well-being has been important to us and part of why we've taken the time to be able to demonstrate that. Um, this is a calculator that we developed, and this one, instead of being focused on turnover retention, is focused on productivity. So I wanted to show it to you because it's just another way of looking at it. And um, just to talk a little bit about this, it, there are a number of assumptions here, uh, and they're based on studies. If you want to download this, uh, calculator will get you directions on how you can do that. But, but the assumptions are based on studies that are cited uh, if you download this calculator and, uh, cited on our website. Uh, with reduced productivity, or in this case reduced revenue generated, it can be very costly to the organization. In this case, with this particular organization that's reflected here, it costs over $120 million because of reduced productivity. And you'll see that we're saying there's a 16% reduction rate um, on, on generated income for those that are burnt out. We estimate that our program reduces burnout by 8% for this group. And by so doing, minus the cost of the program and the time it takes to return to full productivity, we were able to save this organization $8 million, even when you take into account what they were paying for the program. Lastly, in terms of how you might want to demonstrate a return on investment of well-being, 
know, I think that it can be difficult to show it in hard numbers. And, uh, some, and, and sometimes the best thing you can do is just to hear from the people who are benefiting from your well-being initiative, whether or not it's a support program or you're, you're deciding to put scribes into place or you're working on more of a team-based model or you're helping people more with EHR, regardless of what it is that you're offering, uh, you can survey it, but also the, the testimonials can be, I think, pretty moving, uh, especially since what we know is that physicians don't do the greatest job in completing surveys. And so uh, I, I know when I talk to organizations about, oh, what are you finding? What are you learning about this initiative? They'll say, well, we can't hear back from the physicians on how they're feeling about it. But I think if you simply interview them and ask them, you can get some powerful information to let you know whether or not you're moving the needle, whether or not the intervention that you've undertaken is a successful one. Lori, I know you're often asked about what can organizations do and what do you recommend as part of Constellation? How, how can organizations move that needle and make a difference and do it in a meaningful way? So um, I want to emphasize once again that the research that's been done on uh, initiatives shows that, and there's not lots of great randomized double-blinded studies on this. There are very few out there, but the ones that have been published so show to a couple of commenters' points that have been sent in to us that organizational change and culture and initiatives uh, get much more traction and have much more impact than ones that focus on individual resiliency. So um, I, we are big believers in that. And so we think about how can we get the attention of leaders, people in the uh, C-suite of organizations to pay attention to this article? Well, I think it's becoming clearer and clearer, um, as we stated by the group of CEOs that gathered and said this really is an important, impactful issue in healthcare, that they are starting to pay attention, that, that there are uh, financial implications when this issue isn't intended to as an organization. And I would add that without leadership uh, support of practically any initiative, frankly, you're only going to get so far. So this is a very high level suggestion that we think about uh, burnout, resiliency promotion as a quality improvement initiative. And that um, measuring levels of burnout in an organization uh, should be on a dashboard just like expenses, just like any other metrics that boards look at. Um, so engaging board of directors and leadership is important and measurement is important. And then like any good quality improvement project, uh, the data that comes back, whether you're using a Maslach burnout inventory or a mini Z survey, which I'm going to show you in just a bit, um, you have to take that data back to the people uh, who you're measuring and ask them, is this reflective of what you're thinking and feeling about these issues? And then engage them in that and let, let them be um, a part of proposed solutions. So Steve Swenson from Mayo Clinic proposed this listen, act, develop model, which is really like a PDSA model, something all of us in medicine are familiar with, the plan, do, study, act on any improvement. And then you do a, pick a project, try it, and then measure again. So the important part is that the leadership, the culture, the systems must be um, engaged in and committed to this issue. I have to say that I think... Now more than ev ever with uh, the workforce shortages that there's more interest in this because retention and uh, attending to this um, issue as one of the levers that uh, CEOs and other healthcare leaders have in retention, uh, that this is uh, a very important component of that. 
So we do want to highlight that there are a lot of uh, resources freely available on the Steps Forward uh, website that's published by the AMA. There is the link right there. And on that, there are all sorts of uh, modules and resources to help people address this issue in their own organizations. And one of these is this Mini-C survey, which is uh, offered freely. It was developed by Mark Linzer, who is a physician at Hennepin County Medical Center uh, in collaboration with colleagues at Stanford's Wellness Center. And this is a survey tool that's uh, been offered in many healthcare systems and is one that can be trended over time to see how organizations are doing in uh, uh, resiliency promotion. This is, uh, I've got just two slides about, just to show you what is entailed on the Mini-Z survey and how simple it is. Um, it consists of 10 questions asking about how people feel about their job, um, the stress in their job, the control over their work life, um, their workload, uh, the sufficiency of time for documentation, um, how people feel about their work atmosphere, and how their, um, whether or not their professional values are aligned with those of my department leaders, and the degree to which uh, my care team works efficiently together. And going on to the next page, the amount of time I spend on the EHR is, gives a measurement on that and my proficiency. So this is it. It's a 10-question survey with um, an open-ended question on the end. Tell us more about your stresses and what we can do to minimize them. So this is a simple tool. It's actually uh, been sent out to all members of the Minnesota Hospital Association in 2016 and 2017 as a way to get a baseline. Uh, one of our ideas here, um, because I think how can we as a malpractice insurance company also, in addition to highlighting this issue, promote attending to it? And uh, we are really interested in hearing what our organizations are doing and um, how, what kind of successes we, they've had and whether or not we can share those uh, with other organizations. So. This is something that we're really um, highlighting is important to us. So there was a companion article published in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings uh, by some behavioral economists, one by the name of uh, Daniel Ariely in 2015 when this uh, last article was published by Dr. Shanafelt on the trending of burnout. And one of the things they commented on is that uh, there is uh, cognitive scarcity and asymmetric rewards and um, really a sense of isolation um, in, in medicine right now. And I think a lot of people in medicine are feeling that. And so one of the things uh, we believe is important is recognizing how important this sense of belonging and tribe is to physicians professionally and personally. So. There are various things that institutions, whether they're clinics or hospitals or big systems, can do to address this need, again, at a systems level. So uh, supportive communities like um, holding Schwartz rounds, uh, which are talking about the emotionally, spiritually challenging parts of cases. Um, so that's one. Balance groups, which are support groups for physicians. Finding meaning in medicine groups, Again, uh, which are support groups, and th these are found. This is a, a program that was started by Dr. Rachel Naomi Remen, and uh, is available. Uh, template is available to physicians. Uh, clinician salons, where people can come and talk about uh, challenges and connect with people. Peer support programs. Uh, Liz and I have been talking about recently how more and more. Uh, physicians in uh, organizations are asking for peer support groups and how can we support them and, and we have some ideas about that. And just this whole um, fracturing of 
physician communities, uh, we can do things organizationally to promote socialization connection. And those are things that I think are really important. And I just wanted to add uh, that even if you tried this before and didn't get the participation that you would have hoped, please don't let go of it because I think that probably even over the last five years, I think you found more receptivity uh, to participating in programs like this as the need becomes uh, higher and there's growing awareness among the physician community. I think that you'll find you'll, you might very well get more participation than you had in the past. So this is a checklist for uh, physician leaders. Does your organization have the solutions in place to support physician well-being? And this is another resource that will be made available to you. But it does start, as you can see, with collaborative leadership style and engagement of physicians in solutions. And I think um, part of what's happened with um, the switch to more, where more physicians are employed physicians is they have lost a sense of autonomy and control over their um, practice and their work environment. And I really believe uh, the only solution uh, to move us forward is to engage physicians and other healthcare providers in the solutions. I, I, I just can't see that there's any other way around that and that we really need to um, cross what I would recall a chasm uh, between in many institutions between the clinicians and the administrators. And until and unless we do that, I don't, I don't think we'll be able to um, make as big of an impact as we might. So I think it's probably clear to all of you, but uh, from Constellation, MMIC, UMIA, AMIX perspective, uh, we do advocate from a view of risk. And we're also advocating uh, from a view of business outcomes, trying to support all of our clients in improving their outcomes, which includes uh, paying attention to the people that are delivering the care. Um, and we really are focused on our common purpose of helping our insured clinicians to fulfill their personal and professional missions. Uh, we see this as key, and when that isn't possible or not happening, it's, it's distressing. Are there any questions that people might have? Thank you, Dr. Drill Mellum and Ms. Farron. I'd like to remind the audience now for questions that you can submit them by using the chat pod located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Just type your question in the available box and press the blue Send Submit button. Also, in a few moments, a link will appear on your screen for you to click on to access the survey. We do value your feedback, and please ask that you take a few moments to complete this brief survey. Um, right now, I'll go ahead with our first question. Um, actually, in, in, in the queue, it's more like um, a comment. Maybe you could um, reflect on it. Clark is saying that the NAM Action Collaborative on Physician Wellness and Resilience also cites that the focus on burnout should shift from the provider to the structural changes which must occur within organizations to alleviate this problem. Well, I hope from our discussion that um, it's clear that we strongly agree with that comment. Um, that being said, we're also fans of uh, giving physicians uh, tools to help promote their well-being. We don't see that as the answer to this issue. We certainly believe that systemic solutions, systemic um, support and monitoring and attention to this very, very important issue um, is, is where it needs to happen. And again, the three-legged stool, if, if you want to think of it that way, of culture and efficiency when it comes to practice and uh, supporting people in their personal well-being needs 
all will contribute to well-being. Yeah, agreed. And I would say in our experience, um, we, even in our type of solution, we find that more and more energy is going to coaching and supporting leadership so that they're better able to engage their physicians and better able to understand uh, some of the challenges that they're facing. The other thing I'd say is that, you know, turning this around is going to take a while. And I think what we want to be able to do is offer support to physicians in the meantime as they are caught in this transition period of all the changes that are happening in medicine and before some of the problems like the electronic medical records are, are fixed. Um, we we want to offer some avenues for support for that. All right, Debbie is saying or asking how much money is lost due to no-show clients for late can or late cancellations. She's saying that it's exhausting to private practitioners, private practice practitioners, sorry, and frustrating, also causing burnout and disconnection. So I don't have data on how much. Uh, money is lost due to no-shows or late cancellations. Um, I suspect that's, uh, you know, really, you know, specific to individual clinics and practices, and uh, that would be an example, I would think, of, you know, bringing the clinic together and making decisions about how they wanted to attend to that problem. Uh, that being said, it would be interesting, and I suppose that there are, um, you know, medical group management groups where you could um, engage in conversation with colleagues who probably are struggling with the same issues. Um, I myself don't know the numbers around that, but I appreciate, based on your question, that that's um, something of significant impact. All right, next question is from Lori asking, what do you think is an appropriate response to those that are non-provider staffs saying they work more hours and longer hours than providers and experience as much stress, for example, nursing staff? So, again, these are the sort of issues that come up in individual clinics, and uh, that I would... I would make a, a guess that there are issues around communication and feelings of inequity, perhaps feelings of disrespect. I'm, I'm, I'm making uh, guesses at this point. But again, until these conversations can be brought up at the local level, that is the individual clinic level, which could be brought out in surveys, but then the results discussed, um, perhaps with a facilitator, I don't know, um, but these are issues that will only be solved by having a workplace where people can bring up uh, concerns and they can be res uh, discussed respectively, respectfully and collaboratively. Yeah, and I think I would just add to that, I don't know the exact statistics, but the burnout rate for nurses is high as well. Uh, and so, yes to that. Uh, and I, I think it's, as systems are looked at, as clinics and hospitals and healthcare organizations consider how they can best engage their employees, their clinicians, their staff, uh, how they can set the conditions for people to thrive, um, it, it, that's going to help everybody. Uh, and so I don't think in any way we're suggesting that somehow this is only a physician problem, not at all. I think focusing in on this population allows us to get a bit more specific. And I, I know that there are a number of studies right now that are focusing more on the nursing population, so don't in any way want to discount that. Next question from Lewis. Is there any possibility of having one standard user-friendly nationwide EMR? Well, that, that would probably get us into a whole other conversation <laughs> about national health care and a national um, uh, 
readily available electronic health record, which would uh, might solve some problems, it might create others. So I have not heard any discussion about that, but um, it's an idea. But I think it would it'd take a huge national effort when um, we look at our country who uh, was really founded on values of independence and rugged individualism um, and choice. Um, I don't know what it's like in your communities, but uh, in our community outside of Edina where our office is, it's hard to get people to agree on one garbage hauler uh, to decrease the wear and tear on streets. So um, I think it's a great idea, but I, I, I don't know how successful that would be in, um, in the United States. Another question from Renee. Would you share your thoughts on, res on resiliency and how to change the focus burnout to resilience, or should the discussion be burnout? So the trending research over several years really, I think, has been done primarily that's gotten the most um, exposure is the one done by Tate Sh Shanafelt and his colleagues at Mayo Clinic. Um, and as Liz mentioned, he's now at Stanford. And this was trended data and published uh, using the Maslach burnout inventory, which was developed by Christina Maslach in the 1980s um, in Northern California, I think at Berkeley. But in any event, that's where a lot of focus has been on measuring professional burnout. And this wasn't just for physicians, it was other professions. In fact, um, the original term of burnout came out of Germany by a Dr. Freudenberger. Uh, so that's where the focus has been. I, I think you're absolutely right that there is um, uh, efforts to turn this to a more positive way. And, and certainly I have been a part of this in participating with the AMA with a focus on how do we reclaim joy how do we empower people to have more personal agency in their, their work life? Um, how do we engage people from a systemic leadership perspective to promote well-being? Um, certainly, I think you'll uh, see that more and more well-being officers, champions, centers um, are cropping up across the country with Stanford being an example and Mayo Clinic being another where they have a dedicated resources and staff to um, do research and, and uh, try different initiatives. So, I, of course, I love the shift from burnout to resiliency and reclaiming or fostering joy. I, I, it, it's a great point, um, but it does come from this history of using the Maslach burnout inventory. Yeah, I concur with just everything you've said, Lori. I don't know if you've run into this, um, but there are there is a pocket of clinicians who do not like the term resiliency and who feel like um, it, it, it's been a, a term used to blame the victim. You know, physicians aren't resilient. They need to be more resilient. Um, and that somehow if they were more resilient, uh, none of these... Uh, Things happening, none of these problems in healthcare w would be difficult for them, and and so I heard you using the term well-being, and I think that's something we try to use as well. Again, it gives it more of that positive focus of of how do you establish well-being, how do you maintain well-being, and so far I haven't gotten any pushback on that. So uh, yeah, it's an evolution. I think we've been talking about it as burnout, and I think you're going to see it shifting to to more positive language. All right, since we have just a few more minutes left, I'll go ahead with a final question. Um, just let me look in the queue. No. Uh, the question is, with burnout rates so widely known and the costly impact of burnout, why aren't organizations doing more? Well, I, I actually am optimistic uh, that people are starting to pay attention. And it. I I think now, like, the rubber is meeting the road um, when it comes to uh, seeing the financial impact of this on, on many, many levels as, as we've tried to review. So this is this is a been kind of a slow-moving train, um, and I think there's recognition 
like many things, many problems, it won't get better until attention and resources are dedicated and focused on it. So I, I have a lot of confidence that, that we're at a point where people are saying, you know what, we better sit up and deal with it. So um, this is a, a drum that we've been banging for a few years here at Constellation, and Vital Work Life obviously has too. So um, we are quite heartened uh, by this, and we're quite heartened by what the AMA has done in terms of providing all sorts of resource, resources and research freely available to anybody that wants to hop on that website. Um, the National Academy of Medicine um, is, is doing similar work. So I, I, I'm quite heartened by all of uh, the efforts and progress that I've seen in attending to this over the last several years. I as well, and I think I mentioned that I had just been to the Coalition of Physician Wellbeing Conference, and over the last three years, attendance has doubled from one year to the next. So there again, I think seeing some traction that, that is positive to see. All right, that was our last question, but we have some comments thanking you both and enjoying the presentation from Marty and a comment from Clark saying that when they treat someone for alcoholism, they don't treat them to promote wellness, uh, but they cannot eliminate the term burnout from the lexicon when addressing this issue. So I'll throw it back to you, Dr. Drill Mellon and, and Ms. Barron, for any final remarks. Well, again, I, I mean, I can't tell you how grateful we are that you have chosen to take this time to uh, learn about, engage in on this topic that is uh, near and dear to each of our hearts, um, organizationally and personally. So um, thank you very much. I welcome, and I know Liz does too, any questions or feedback ideas you might have on this, any sharing of information. We've tried to share what we think is helpful with you. And to that end, I also want to remind you that this was just part one of a, a webinar series of two. And our next one is gonna be on September 5th, uh, and it's titled Combating Burnout, a Research-Based Approach to Solutions. This webinar will discuss Vital Work Life 2017 Physician and Advanced Practice Provider well-being solution survey, which assesses responses on stress levels and barriers to accessing well-being solutions and reports on results of their perceived value of proposed solutions. So Vital Work Life went to the front line of care and asked their physicians and advanced practice providers um, what they we're feeling, experiencing regarding stress and what uh, barriers th there were to accessing well-being solutions and how did they value these well-being solutions that were proposed. And so, Liz, you might want to say something Well, just that, that we, we had three different categories. We had um, well-being initiatives such as counseling or coaching or uh, continuing education, continuing medical education, kinds of maybe you'd say services that an organization might make available to their clinician population. Then we had a number of different um, attributes of culture and asked them to rate their own uh, experiences with that and their own organization and then also what aspects of culture seem to be the most important to them in, in continuing their well-being. The last thing we looked at was business processes and workflow and uh, asked about a number of different issues that, that are commonly identified as creating difficulties for clinicians and again um, asked what kinds of measures have been taken that have the most positive impact to them. So we delighted to share that information with you. Yeah, so we hope that you'll join us for part two of this where you'll hear much more from people on the front line of care and what's important to them and what their experience has been. And again, we want to thank you for your time and attention today and we look forward to any of your feedback, which you'll be getting a survey for feedback on this webinar, and please let us know if uh, there are other uh, topics or issues of concern in your feedback so we can address them in the next webinar. So thank you very much. 
Thank you. On behalf of Constellation and our growing portfolio of MPL insurance companies, including MMIC, UMIA, and Arkansas Mutual, I'd like to thank each of you for joining us today. If you haven't already done so, please click on the link and fill out the evaluation survey. A recording of this webinar and handout materials will be available on our website and YouTube channel. This does conclude our program. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.